Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12th installment of Spartan Step Up, Case Western Reserve University Community Response to COVID-19. This web series is coordinated by the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University. I am Joy Ward, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Our broadcast today will focus on dealing with holiday stress during COVID-19. We have with us three panelists who will share their insights. First is Dr. Amy Przeworski, Associate Professor of Anxiety Disorders in the Department of Psychological Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Przeworski. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. We have also with us Dr. Linda sharp Taylor, an alumna of Western Reserve College. Dr. sharp Taylor is the staff psychologist for Sisters of St. Mary Health Cardinal Glennon Hospital and adjunct faculty at St. Louis University School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. sharp Taylor. Thank you very much. Wonderful to have you today. We also have Dr. Elizabeth Short, Professor of Psychology, Director of Developmental Master's Program, and Co-Director of Childhood Studies in the Department of Psychological Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Short. Thanks for having me. We have some questions that were submitted when viewers registered to attend this webcast, and we are also taking questions live via the chat feature and also in the comments section if you are watching this on Facebook Live we will try to get as many questions in as possible. We all know the holidays can be stressful for some, but here we are in 2020 and there is a major pandemic going on. Holiday stress coupled with COVID-19 is a new frontier for all of us. Dr. Przeworski, can you please share with, your, with our viewers some advice on managing stress during this unprecedented time? Yes, I am going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, so, so first I just wanna start with saying that um, if you're experiencing stress right now, you're not alone. Everyone is experiencing massive amounts of stress right now. Um, I am working and I'm a parent. I have two kids who are remote schooling. So on a daily basis, I am highly, highly stressed. And that's despite the fact that, you know, I know about managing um, stress or what I should be doing. That doesn't make it easy to do. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that um, are kind of um, ways to identify that you're experiencing stress and then also things that you can do to try to manage your stress. Um, but again, these take practice. These are things that you have to really make sure that you're practicing um, on a regular basis. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is kind of this, um, what we have in our, in our minds about what the holidays are gonna look like. Um, for many people, this is sort of what they envision. You know, you're sitting, you're relaxing, you've got your feet up. Um, and yet for many of us, this is more like what you actually experience, um, that you're stressed, your concern about all of the things that you need to do, and you're not sure how you're going to get them all done. Um, when you think about things like, oh, I'm going to open presents, it's going to be so great, everyone's going to love it. Um, so again, this is kind of the idyllic image that we have in our minds. And this is often more like what it tends to look like, that somebody's disappointed or somebody is um, unhappy or somebody is um, dysregulated. Um, and so first of all, one of the things you need to think about are that for most of us, it's not going to look like this an idyllic type of picture. For most of us, there is going to be um, some um, departure from what we might expect or what we might hope our holidays are going to look like. So there are lots and lots of causes of stress um, during COVID and also lots of causes of stress um, during the holidays. Um, we often have high expectations for ourselves and high expectations for others. We want to make people happy. We want others to, um, to be pleased with us. We want to keep other people um, not stressed and keep other people happy. And sometimes that means that we're taking on um, a lot. We're taking on responsibility for how other folks are gonna feel. Um, there's a lot of isolation right now because we can't get together with others. Um, and that can put some additional pressure on us if we feel like um, there are expectations for us to kind of follow our typical types of um, traditions. Finances 
um, can be a huge stressor um, during a, a typical year, um, but an even larger stressor during COVID. Work-life balance is one that I hear a lot about um, parents struggling with this um, and students struggling with this. Um, and then also focusing on the future and the past, um, what things look like in the past and how I wish they were different or what things, what I want things to look like in the future and how I'm not happy with how things are right now. Um, and then COVID itself. So concerned about, um, am I going to get COVID? Is a friend of mine going to get COVID? Um, are there going to be enough um, healthcare workers to, to help me and provide services if um, I end up getting COVID? So there's a lot on our plate. Um, and I think that's important for us all to recognize that there's a lot on our plate right now. So now I want to talk a little bit about how stress manifests, what it looks like. It can look like irritability. So somebody being cranky, somebody throwing temper tantrums, um, snapping at other people because they're irritable. Um, and that is one of the ones that, that I certainly see in myself that I get, I get cranky um, when I am highly stressed. It can also look like poor sleep. So you might have a hard time getting to sleep. You may have insomnia. You may wake up frequently in the middle of the night. You may have anxiety dreams. Um, and so sleep is a great barometer of how you're doing in terms of your stress. You may have tight muscles or um, lots of tension or lots of pain in your muscles. Sometimes that can translate into things like headaches or um, pain in your jaw if you're clenching your jaw a lot. Um, I already talked about snapping at other people. It can also look like GI upset. Um, and another thing that kind of comes along with the stress are negative thoughts. So we all have this tape that plays in our head and the tape that plays in our head can be um, positive. So things are good, I'm excited to be doing this, or it can be negative. This is all bad, I'm not doing a good enough job. Um, I should be doing better, I should be doing more. It can look like things like physiological responses, like your heart racing or skipping. Um, it can look like feeling fatigued and exhausted all the time. So that sense of burnout and I just can't take on anymore. And it can also look like having a hard time relaxing and kind of unwinding. So even when you have time to unwind, you may feel like you can't unwind. So now I wanna talk a little bit about what we can do to try to manage all of the stress that we are experiencing. One of the things to think about is what your expectations are. Are your expectations reasonable or do you have expectations that you could not possibly meet? Often people who are highly stressed are going to say, well, I have to be perfect. I have to do everything perfectly. And that's their goal. And we can never be perfect. We can never reach perfection. So you're really setting yourself up for failure and disappointment if you've made that the goal. So you wanna do a good enough job um, and um, accept what you're doing right now, except how the job is that you're doing right now. You also have to recognize that you really can't make everyone happy, um, especially with things like COVID. If there's any pressure um, from your family to get together for the holidays, you may have these, um, some people saying we should get together and some people saying we don't wanna get together. There's no way you're going to be able to make everyone happy. And you have to recognize that's okay. It's not your responsibility to make everyone happy. It's also helpful if you can connect with the values that you have related to the holidays. So often in the holidays, we sort of lose touch of the point of the holidays. The holidays are supposed to be about valuing our friends, valuing our family, connecting with traditions, connecting with um, the religious meaning of the holiday if, um, if you're religious or the spiritual meaning of the holidays. Um, and so if you can really connect with those values, why are these holidays important? What are the aspects of these holidays that are important? And what are the aspects that are kind of less important? Then that can help you to really connect with what matters to you, connect with the meaning of the holidays. Another thing you can do is ask for help when you need it. This is something I am notoriously terrible at. Um, I tend to take on everything <laughs> and think, I'm just gonna do it all. And then I get exhausted. And so asking for help when you need help is a skill. And it's a skill, again, that, that many people are, are not great at. So it's something you really do need to practice. Um, when you realize I'm in over my head, I can't do all of this, ask someone else to help you with whatever it is that they can, they can help with. Um, I'm asking my kids to help me out with things. And it's great. They feel um, better because they're helping. They are gaining new skills. They're doing more chores in the house. And they see a reduction in my stress, which is something that's also um, rewarding for them. 
Another thing that you can do to try to reduce your stress is to focus on the present moment. This is something that many people are not good at. Many people focus on, well, eventually things are going to get better or I'll feel better when. Um, but that means what you're doing is you're, you're, you have this future focus, this future orientation, and you're not thinking about what's good right now. So one of the, the skills that we will often teach people who are anxious or who are stressed is to focus on the here and now and what's pleasant in the here and now. So um, a great example is um, you can do chores, so household chores, like doing the dishes. And you do them and it's just, oh, I got to get this done. I got to check this off my list and move on to the next thing. Um, and what you do by doing, by having that approach is that, again, you have this future orientation and you're not really enjoying what you're doing in the moment. Instead, you can focus on things like the enjoyable aspects of what it is that you're doing right now. So you can focus on things like the warmth of the water while you're doing dishes and, oh, it feels so great. It's like my hands are in like a nice warm bath. Or you can focus on the, the great soapy smell, how it smells so clean when you're doing these dishes. Um, let's say that you're stuck in traffic. That's one of the most frustrating things. I gotta go, I gotta get there. But if you focus on things like, this is a great song that's on the radio and I can kind of jam out to the song or I've got a moment of peace to myself. I sometimes sort of miss my commute now because it was time where I could just kind of be quiet, reflect. Um, and, and that was kind of helpful and nice. Um, so whatever it is that you're doing in the moment, you should be really focusing on that moment and enjoying what you're experiencing in that moment. Another example of this is when you're eating, you can eat in a really mindful way where you taste the food that you're eating and you really enjoy that, that food or you can be watching TV and you're just kind of shoveling food in and not attending to it. You're gonna enjoy the food more if you're eating in a mindful way. where you are really focusing on um, savoring the food as you're eating it. Again, you can connect with values of why am I doing this thing that I'm doing right now? So if I'm doing laundry, instead of just, oh, I've gotta get this done and move on, um, you can think about, oh, I'm doing laundry as a way to care for my family. And think about how happy this person is gonna be when they see all of their laundry nice and clean and fresh, and they've got all of the things that they could possibly want to wear right there in front of them. If you connect with that, um, those values of I value my family and I'm caring for them, suddenly laundry isn't quite as much of a chore. Another thing that you can do during the holidays or just during COVID in general is to connect with other people. We're all isolated right now and we have less human contact. And that's something that can um, lead to us feeling more stressed feeling more disconnected from others and feeling like we're the only people who are experiencing this thing. So connecting with others is really important in terms of your mood and your stress level. And right now we have to be creative about ways that we can connect with others. So you could do something like a virtual holiday party. Um, you can get together with friends or family um, using an online type of means. I text with my friends all the time and that's something that keeps me sane when I am so stressed and really you know, just losing it, texting with my friends and hearing like, oh, I feel the same way is something that can really help. You can use social media. So I'll sometimes post something that's funny on Facebook about, you know, my day today is a dumpster fire or something. And people will be like, oh yeah, mine too. I hope things get better. And just that can make me feel less alone and make me feel more connected. Obviously you can call all your friends or your family. And then we've actually talked about going back old school and starting to send some letters and cards to people who are not seeing as much. It's a great way if you have kids for them to practice things like, you know, their writing skills. And it's awesome when you get something in the mail that you weren't expecting, um, that can be a huge mood booster. So I'm um, sorry to the post office, which is already kind of busy, but um, this is something going old school is something that can be helpful. You can also manage your stress through self-care. Again, this is something that you really need to practice quite a bit because it's hard to get in the habit of doing this. It's hard to prioritize yourself. But if you prioritize yourself and you engage in self-care, it's something that makes you more productive. It improves your mood, it reduces your stress level, and it means you're going to better be able to do all of the things you need to do. So if you do 30 minutes of relaxation every day, that could be meditation, it could be yoga, it could be breathing exercises. There are lots of ways that you can do this relaxation. Um, you could imagine yourself on a beach if that's something that's relaxing to you. Um, as long as you're practicing it every day, it's something that can be incredibly helpful. 
you also want to engage in good sleep hygiene. This is one that many college students are not great at. Um, you want to have the same bedtime every single night, including on weekends. You want to wake up at the same time every single day, even on weekends. You don't want screens right before bed because that really keeps you awake. You don't want to eat right before bed either because, again, that's something that can really keep you awake. You really want to engage in relaxing activities for 20 to 30 minutes every single night before bed, whether that's reading, whether that's doing some meditation, whatever it is that will help you to relax that does not involve a screen is going to be something that's going to help you to get better sleep at night. And better sleep is going to translate into feeling less stressed. Exercise is a huge stress management skill. Um, I know that Dr. Short and I, we talk all the time about how we'll go for a run and we just feel so much better after going for a run or after exercising. It's the way that we handle our stress and it's an adaptive way to handle stress, an adaptive way to cope. Um, so exercise is a huge mood booster and a huge stress reducer. And then hobbies as well. So whether it's doing crafts or whatever it is that your hobby is, playing a musical instrument, that's something that can give you a mood boost. And again, it's a way for you to kind of get a break from the stress you're experiencing. So here are a bunch of resources for people. I put a couple YouTube videos up there um, that are um, kind of relaxing YouTube videos that you can try, but there are tons of them on the internet. So if you just search for relaxation or meditation or breathing exercises, you'll find a lot on YouTube. Um, there's a website that has all kinds of information about anxiety and stress from the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Um, so you can click right on that website or you can just search for Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And then there are some books that are kind of self-help books that can help you, or if you have a child who's experiencing a lot of anxiety and stress, it can help your child to try to reduce your anxiety and stress. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Przeworski, for that wonderful focus on um, mindfulness and, and living in the present. And then I really enjoyed the, the discussions on values. So thank you for that wonderful presentation. Absolutely. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Sharp Taylor, I'm hoping you can provide us some guidance on trauma and managing emotions as we enter into the holiday season during a pandemic. Thank you. Um, it's probably going to overlap with the previous presentation, but which I think is good, so it can reinforce some of the things that we've talked about. But as humans, we have uh, a very, very effective survival system. It's kept us on the planet since the very beginning. So I think it's helpful when you're trying to understand emotions, kind of understand their relevance and why they exist. We have emotions, all the good ones, all the bad ones, because they protect our survival. So you never wanna get rid of any of your feelings, even the ones that we don't like. We don't like anger or shame or guilt, but those provide for us a part of our survival mechanism. And that survival mechanism starts off with our brain. The brain's main function is to protect our survival. And so it has a very elaborate system of taking in information from the environment through our senses. So it's always screening for any signs of threat or potential harm. And the brain takes that information in and registers it and may give some sort of emotional reaction to it. If I play this game sometimes with people, but if you give me an emotion, I can tell you what the survival benefit of that emotion is, okay? So let's take one, I would offer one up that is very common, is anger, okay? Well, what's the benefit of anger? Well, anger is a sign that there's some injustice. And because of that injustice, and we feel the anger, we now have the motivation to correct that injustice. So. If there were no anger, there never would have been a revolutionary war. There never would have been the civil rights movement. There never but went been suffrages. The, all of these things come out of a sense of that's unfair. And so it motivates. And when we make changes to motivate things to make things more fair, then that's important to our survival. Okay. 
Uh, the system that triggers our emotions and anger are part of what we call the amygdala. And that's the system in the brain that um, registers the information and sends out an emotion that says, take some action. Okay, uh, this is connected with the uh, notion or idea that one way to take an action, and I think this has particular uh, re relevance for COVID, is that we know that for most dangers, the place where we need to take action is to connect with our herd, to connect with other people. If I'm the lone one out there, then the, it's likely the tiger is going to get me. But if I'm connected to my family, my herd, my friends, then I'm feeling more safe and more protected. But now we're being told in the COVID, don't connect, don't be, don't go. And that's against what we would naturally and normally want to do in order to be more, feel more safe. Um, and so when people resist information that says stay home, there's a, and to me, there's a really an evolutionary and biological reason why they don't want to do that. They want to connect with their family and friends because we feel scared. Um, the other part of the system is um, memory. Our brains are very good at remembering, probably more than anything, situations of threat. We want to remember that the last time I touched that slivering thing on the ground, I got bit, and I want to stay away from it. So when we're exposed to negative situations or traumatic situations, it's going to trigger memories of similar situations so that I have learned, it's a part of learning, to stay away from that. So as I discuss this, I, I want to go back to the, those two points, that our emotions protect our survival and that we want to specifically remember things in order to further protect our survival. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm not quite, I've got a few more. I'm, I'm, I got a few, I'll, I'll say goodbye when I'm done. Um, I don't want to, but cut me off if I go over my time. No, 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 we don't want to cut you off. I really enjoyed this, so continue on. I, I, okay, I, thank you. Um, okay, so here's another aspect of it, and this is in terms of memory, is to think about what your history has been with traumatic situations. So in the middle of COVID, um, you can um, build maybe things that you've uh, dealt with in the past, illnesses, etc., maybe triggering some of those past memories, and that may be making it difficult. Now, I don't want to over-pathologize COVID. Whether it's a syndrome and it may end up being one, we'll have to see. But really, it's too early. We're still in the middle of it to say that we're even post-traumatic. We're really in the middle of dealing with the crisis. So your previous experiences with crisis, with trauma, are going to impact your current situation. Um, so, in the, and I'll give a personal example. I had a health scare earlier this year and I don't want to go through that again. So COVID triggers a lot of feelings for me about my health and being careful and it makes me uh, more precautious. Now, here's the thought that I want to leave you with is when you are dealing with whether or not this is something that I should be ex uh, very concerned about. As psychologists, we deal with two things to determine whether something is a uh, symptom or whether it's part of a, um, a regular occurrence or a, a expected reaction to a, a difficult situation. So for example, uh, we deal with the issues of intensity and duration. Irritability is something we all experience. But if I'm having that irritability and it's been a week since I've and I've been going, this has been going on, and the intensity of it is off the chain, then that's definitely something I need to be paying more close attention to and maybe seeking the help of a professional. So collectively, we are uh, still in the middle of this pandemic, and therefore our adjustment afterwards is not going to be understood or known until afterwards. But we will have to go through some things. Trauma changes the way you think about yourself, your community, and relationships. And so 
obviously going through, we're going to be modifying some things and learning some things about ourselves and each other that we'll have to use that information later on to figure out how we truly want to make our adjustment. So here's what we can do. And this is my favorite one, and I'm not going to repeat all the things on my list because I think we've gone over them already. But the ones that I think are most important, that, and it, maybe it's just the one that's the most important, is to offer lots of grace to each other and to ourselves. And by that, I mean uh, we cannot continue to go through a, a difficult situation, traumatizing situation, and expect ourselves to be the same way that we would or react the same way as if this wasn't going on. So when you feel like you're acting outside of your normal sphere and what you, how you normally would handle situations, you got to deal with it. It is what it is. But you also may want to think about give yourself some grace. And when other people are acting in ways that you are concerning, give them some grace as well. Thank you. That was wonderful, um, Dr. Sharp Taylor. And I was really struck by your context of the underlying biology of emotions. Um, I really appreciated hearing about that and about how our response now is connected with our past and will affect our future, I think is something we're not thinking about as much. And so that was really informative. And I really love that the idea of giving ourselves grace and others. So I'm gonna remember that myself and everything I do. So, so thank you for that, really important words. Um, and moving forward um, in this discussion, let's not forget children as we talk about the holidays during the pandemic. Um, Dr. Short, what are your thoughts on what parents and other adults can do for children during this time? So hopefully I'm sharing my slides. Can you see these? Probably not, right? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. This is where this is where you know I'm not as good at this as my junior colleague Amy. Uh, so hold on here. Let's just see. You're getting close. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's see if we can do this now. Now? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so I have the delightful charge to follow two very esteemed speakers who've already covered much of what I wanted to cover as well, except to say that all of you probably are thinking about now how given that we're stressed given that the holidays are unusual for all of us, how will that then impact our children? And so if you look at this beautiful little child on this slide, my nephew, I might add, it's lovely to see that he doesn't seem to have a care in the world, right? He's happy as a clam in this time of COVID. So let's see if this is going to work here. So what I would say, and much like everybody else, the holidays season normally is chock full of feelings, right? We are excited, we're worried, we're stressed, we're all going kind of crazy. And now we have COVID on top of all of this. And so much like Linda just said, and Amy said previously, I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge the feelings that we're all having, whether they be worried, whether they be sadness, whether they be excitement, but also to kind of nurture ourselves and adjust our expectations and kind of think about the big picture and not be so hard on ourselves because we want things to be perfect. And quite frankly, I'm not sure what perfect is. I've given that up a long time ago in my attempt at being a faculty member with three kids under three and a husband in medical school. Perfect just seemed to be an elusive experience for me. And so uh, COVID or not COVID, I think all of us need to kind of be, <clears throat> be careful. So I have this little slide here. It's probably a good synopsis of what um, Linda and Amy both said, but all of these little tools I have on this slide designed to manage anxiety are the kinds of things that I think parents need to involve their children in because we need to do this for us and we need to do this for them. And recognize that your kids, for the most part, are taking all their clues 
about how to interpret what's going on in their life from you, the parent, from you, the adult. They've looked to you from day one for what to be afraid of, what not to be afraid of, what to be excited about. And so I think for all of us, we need to do everything we can to manage our own emotional states, to acknowledge our own emotional states, and to help kids understand the emotional states. And so I think all of these activities, whether it be, you heard Amy say, I love to run from the time my children were little, they were out running with me. Maybe they weren't running very fast, but that was good because then I didn't have to run very fast either, right? I knew I could keep up with a three-year-old and a five-year-old, or at least sometimes I could keep up with them. But to involve them in the various activities, whether it be exercising, journaling, I don't care if your children can't write yet, they can picture journal, you know, practicing gratitude. All these activities are things that help us to redirect our crazy emotional state and to empower our children to understand how emotions play an important part in our, in our world and how we can all learn how to manage them. If you think about what the holidays are like for little kids, right? It's all about traditions and family traditions. And I tried to, to give a potpourri of pictures here to kind of symbolize different activities parents do with their children. But I think it's important to remember that all they're looking for is ways to connect with their family. And that in fact, there are, and I'll get to it later, some positives of COVID. And that is that families have really gotten closer in this time of COVID than they had in the past. Because in the past, we were rushing about our life, whether it be our work life or whatever it happened to be. And we really family was kind of the thing that we came home to. And now our children and our families are taking center stage in a way that they otherwise didn't in the past. It creates some new friction, but nonetheless, it is, I think, some of the interesting positives that have come about as a function of COVID. The holiday season is here and it definitely looks different, right? But we really have to focus on all the quality time that we have with our children, whether it be through fun activities like Elf on the Shelf, right? I always think it's kind of funny about Elf on the Shelf when kids are excited about the elves coming out. And if I were them, I would say, get rid of those elves. That elf is going to snitch to Santa how bad I am, right? I don't want him reporting on me, right? But they seem to be excited to have the elf there. It, but now we have COVID elves, right, with their little masks on. And kids are doing a lot of activities and that involve traditions, and they're still in place. They're just being done in the confines of the home environment. And that we have opportunities, like what was discussed before, if sharing these opportunities do it by doing virtual engagements with our family and our friends and our neighbors. And we have people caroling on their balconies or on their front porches all over neighborhoods as people are connecting in that sort of way. Linda mentioned, and I'm going to say it again, about this notion about being gentle with yourselves. But I think right now with our kids, it's really important to indulge kids with a lot of affection. Of course, I'm a big believer in that anyway, quite frankly. But I think even now, or especially now, we need to do that. We need to recognize that there's this new norm called maskness. And there's this new norm called being six feet apart. And we can make it scary for these kids or we can make it fun because if we laugh about it and we keep our perspective on this, so too will our, will our children. So if you are fearful and projecting that fearfulness to your children, then they will be fearful. If you inform and you educate and you talk about reasons underlying these things, really it can be fun. It can be part of the game. It can be part of the you know six feet apart dance party that we do with our children that really brings some joy to the environment, yet still keeps that distance. I wanna stress one important thing to, that we all know and that we sometimes lose sight of, that the parent's job is really to provide stability and support to their children. Amy talked about a moment ago, this notion of barometer, but I wanna just stress the fact that parents are the barometer for their children, that parents' emotions their attitudes set the tone for the child's worldview. If the parent is happy, 
all is well in the world for the child, right? If the parent is scared, the child is scared. Children look to their parents for how to interpret situations. And so we have to be very mindful, as was said before, about our own emotional state so that we can make sure we're being the most stable, supportive influence to our child. There are new norms for sure, but those don't have to be necessarily scary norms. We need to talk to our kids. We need to explain to our kids about this. We need to listen to our kids. You know, we need to allow kids to explore their environment and not be afraid to explore their environment, but to explore their environment in a safe sort of fashion. We need to give them honest and accurate feedback and teach them the simple steps about how to remain healthy. What I tried to say a moment ago, and I really do mean this, and I'm doing a pretty fun study on this right now, is there's a lot of positives we're hearing about COVID as well right now. As parents engage in more family time, they engage in fun activities like arts and crafts of creating a mask. Anybody who's having trouble getting their kids to wear a mask, think about the number of little face or headbands and faces and costumes we've created with our children in years gone by and they were all excited to wear them. Why not the mask? Let it be something that they can create of their own accord and add little sparkles to it and make it unique and make it a part of themselves. It doesn't have to be a scary thing to ward off all these evil things in the world. It can be a fun thing just designed to make them safe. So we kind of underplay how scary this time really is as we talk to our kids about the power they have to make themselves safe. We have family times where we do cooking classes. I know my, I have, I'm one of seven um, siblings and we all have families and we've had family Zoom times where we're all making cookies together and everybody is doing some kind of fun activity and we're having dance parties. And it's not in person, which we would be doing at this time of year, but it's on the video and everybody is having a blast and everybody's being silly together because we're being connected in an activity that both bonds us to our own family and bonds us to our extended family. I know that homeschooling has been a real stressful thing for people. And, you know, I, I think about it and I think about how fortunate I am that my children are young adults now and that I'm not really doing that and how taxing that might be. But We've always been involved in the schooling of our children. That's what parents do as they help to orchestrate and supervise the learning. And so I think helping kids to gain independence while keeping a watchful eye is really an important thing. And by the way, I'm all about the business of creating home movies and creating videos. And so my mother is 96 years old and in Minnesota and I don't get to see her, but she gets to see videos of all of us and the activities that we're engaging in on a daily basis, not a weekly basis, on a daily basis, because unfortunately she forgets what I'm talking about from day one to day two, as many 96 year olds do. And so we have to make that constant contact. And all of my children are involved in this process because it is a family activity. So we have this purpose that we're doing together that's designed to help keep grandmother grounded in the reality of what we know to be the holidays and family. So lots of fun family activities that might not have occurred had there not have been COVID because we might not have taken the time to in fact do these kinds of things. I'm an outside person, as Amy said, I'm a runner and I'm also a huge hiker. And boy, I know COVID has changed that because everyone's out there in my hiking arena right now. And as I'm trying to keep my six feet, they're invading my territory, but I'm happy to see the positives of that as families are coming together with their kids and enjoying the outdoors. And I know there's, boy, a lot to be learned about the world and each other through being outdoors. Those are positives. Are there negatives? Sure. You know, the balancing act of home, job, and play is really a hard one. And Amy and Linda both talked about, be gentle with yourselves. We can't do it all. We never could do it all. I don't know why we thought we could do it all, but now we know we can't do it all. And so trying to be realistic about what you can do and enjoying the moments and living in this moment is really an important thing. Don't look too far to the future. We don't know what will happen. I, you know, the hope for me is 
that I'll be able to get on an airplane so I can go see my 96 year old mother, right? That's my big hope in the future, but I can't look that far. So I'm gonna have to just keep engaging in right now and balancing my home life here and my connection with her there. And she's got a great perspective because she says, you don't need to come and see me here. I see you every day on this computer. I talk to you every day on this computer. So maybe we should all share the perspective that my 96 year old mother says in terms of all this connectedness, maybe it's great that we have these resources and take advantage of them and be happy about it. Protect your mental health, validate your feelings. When you're stressed, do something to change it, right? I say dance parties, that's my idea of a good time. Go into your kitchen, Amy said, put your hands in the water and feel the water. I'm always feeling the water and I'm splashing the water and I'm dancing around because first of all, it's good exercise. It gets my endorphins up. It makes everybody else laugh because I'm a terrible dancer. And so all I'm trying to say is, you know, enjoy the moment. You know, nobody promises you moments in the future, by the way. So live today because that's, that's the model we need to make to develop for our children. Are our children stressed? Well, they're stressed if we're stressed. That's the best way I can tell you. And I think that many parents worry about their children, but what I know about children is they're very resilient and they have self-writing tendencies. And many of them, this is all they know. I have a nephew I have yet to see. And he was born in the middle of this pandemic. Nobody has seen him but his parents. And this new mother is struggling with raising a child and not getting feedback from anybody in the environment. And yet we get online and she calls me as the ch resident child psychologist saying, what's going to happen to my child? And I said, nothing, you're going to love them. You're going to smell the roses and enjoy them and breathe and go slowly and live your life because that's what it's all about at this moment in time. And worrying about tomorrow and whether or not your children are going to be scarred by this experience, they only will be if you fall apart because parents, as I said, are the barometer for their children. So again, I, 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 take, I think this time is stressful for a lot of people, but I also think it is a wonderful time to reconnect with the you know, the wonders of family and the wonders of the world and to be thankful and to express gratitude to one another and to feel grateful that I could share all this with all of you and that you could all join us today in this presentation with my lovely colleagues and my new dean. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Short. I really appreciated you really making us aware of the impact of COVID on the next generation, but also the the positive role we we could really play here. And also so appreciated the beautiful stories of your family. That, that was really lovely to hear. Thank you for Thank that. You. I'm take up your, your dancing. I always had this like <laughs> yard dancing during the pandemic in the night when no one could see you. I think that'd be a nice <laughs> Now I don't care if they see, you know, you just yeah. have to have a sense of humor. That would be lovely. <laughs> So thank you for that. So we have some questions that were submitted um, during the registration that I would like to. The first one I think is probably best for Dr. Przeworski. Um, a Case Western Reserve University research engineer would like to know, how do you recommend handling the stress, anxiety, and helplessness of being the parent of a son or a daughter who has lost um, his or her job due to COVID? That's a great question and, and something that I'm sure a lot of people are struggling with right now. Um, it First of all, I, I think it's important to recognize that all of those emotions are things that um, most people would experience in response to seeing their child struggling. As parents, we all want the best for our children, whether they're they're young or whether they're, they're grown. Um, so I think, first of all, recognizing that it's okay to experience that sense of helplessness. It's okay to experience some anxiety and stress, um, and that you know that's normal. That's that's normative. That's what we would expect. Um, but I think you need to think about yourself and um, engaging in self care to reduce your own anxiety and stress, so that you can serve as a support for your child who has lost their job. I also think it's important to communicate with your child about 
what could be helpful. Um, often we do things um, to try to communicate that we care and we have sort of our own love language. Um, so for me, I cook for people and that's the way that I show that I care about them. Um, but other people, they may not even recognize that that's the way that I'm caring about them or they may not want me to cook for them. So I think asking your child, what can I do that would be helpful? What is it that you need right now? Do you need financial support? Do you need emotional support? Can I help to reduce your stress in some way? Can I help you to search for jobs? Or would you not want me to do that? Um, I think if you jump in and try to do what you think they want, um, it may not work out so well because it may not really be what, what that person needs in the moment. Um, so I think it's important to, to respect um, what your, your child needs in the moment. And again, to engage in that self-care for yourself as well. Thank you. I believe the next question is probably best for Dr. Short. Um, from a friend at the university, what are the recommendations for someone who lives by themselves to combat stress during these cold and stressful times? And you, you alluded that to, to what your mother has been doing and what you've been doing for your mother. So I think mm -hmm. you've already really provided a beautiful example, but any more thoughts on that? Well, I think the really important thing to think about is, first of all, to think about reaching out. You know, too often when we're alone, we think, oh my God, I'm alone, I have nothing to do. And instead of focusing on the self to focus on someone else who might need something often brings great joy to the so-called giver. So I would encourage two things. One, to think about what would help you, but two, to think about other people who might need your help. Again, I have my 96-year-old mother and I have a 99-year-old former colleague who I reach out to all the time. And so those two keep the focus for me off my loneliness and instead help me to focus on the giving to other. That whole notion of gratitude and giving to other is a really wonderful, powerful healer, I think, for a lot of people. And it helps fulfill us in a way that is a good de a deterrent or a distractor for loneliness. It's it's funny you don't you don't focus on that loneliness as much when you're thinking about other people. So again, I know it's hard, and I think you know also um, there's kind of that give and take, right? So there's a give back that goes on as we give to others. There's things we get in return that then really changes the scenario for ourselves. I have to add a, a really beautiful example. My daughter, who's an eighth grader, did where she, you know, teenagers really want to see each other. And they put together some chats to work on um, holiday cards for mm -hmm. those in a retirement community. So they had the time online to gather to make the cards and with a lot of socializing. And then they, at that same time, they were doing something good for the community. So I, I, I thought, you yeah, know, that's great. Really. Um, help um, in multiple ways all at the same time. So thank you mm -hmm. for that um, wonderful answer and, and the great question. That's a great example. Um, there's a question um, from the parent of a, of a current student um, and that is how can I tell if my son is stressed? He doesn't like to share his feelings overall but seems happy when interacting with us. He does spend, however, most of his time in his room doing his homework um, and hobbies. And I think that one's a, a great one for Dr. Sharp Taylor to, to address for us. Certainly. Um, I think the, the question there, I'm sort of going to read between the lines, but I think it goes back to something I said a little earlier. Identifying whether or not your children are stressed out or above the level that you would raise concern is about intensity and duration. Mm -hmm. Being off in your room, depending if the child is a certain age, certainly 14 year olds don't always spend a whole lot of time with the family. That's not always their first thing. And it's sort of like if they're in the room chatting with friends or, you know, playing games or whatever, they are socializing. They're just not socializing with the family. So in this particular situation, maybe having a conversation with your child um, where are you in a <clears throat> sort of careful way express what your concerns are and then creating something with your child and with families. And I think this was alluded to earlier. It's time to blow the dust off of those board games 
and maybe start a family uh, board game night where you get the Monopoly board out or the Scrabble board. And um, it, the issue is not just the competitiveness of being there, but the whole idea of sharing time together. And if your child is doing that and participating in other family activities, then a little alone time in your room is not really that concern. Now, when there's avoidance of any family time, then that might raise concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Really, really helpful. Um, the next question is from a current staff member in the School of Medicine. I do not have children, but what are some of the things I can do to support my friends and family who are parents while we're maintaining a physical distance? And I think, um, Dr. Przeworski, that's probably one in, in your camp. Yes, absolutely. So um, I am a parent who is absolutely in this situation. So I've got a whole wish list of things that I could send to you <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, but um, also, yeah, I work with kids who are anxious and families who are stressed as well. Um, so, so again, I think kind of asking what the family needs or what would be helpful to the family is, is one way to go. Um, also, often uh, parents who I talk to are struggling with you know, doing their job and then also having to make dinner and you know, feed their kids every single meal during the day. Um, and so you could, you know, have a pizza delivered to them or, you know, drop off food. I'm constantly baking things because I, I, I stress bake. Um, and so there's been a lot of baking going on recently because I bake when I'm, I'm stressed. And so I've been dropping off cookies and other baked goods to families, just as like a, a cute what little surprise. Me? Sorry, sorry, Betsy. I, I should what tell you your um, Just as a cute little surprise for them that they mm -hmm. open their door and wow, yeah. there's like, you know, some, some snack for them to eat. Um, you could also ask if um, they need anything at the store, if you're putting in an online mm -hmm. order or you're going to the store. Um, you could offer to play games with the kids, depending on the kid's age, um, via Zoom, um, just to give the parents a little bit of peace and quiet and time where they're not having to manage um, the, the child. You could send books or toys that can keep the, the kids busy, again, depending on the kid's age. Um, and another one that I think um, could be really cute is to put something in um, a person's front lawn. Um, so you could put like pink flamingos in someone's lawn or something like that so that when they open the door, they're like, oh my gosh, what just happened to our lawn? Um, anything that's going to be kind of like a mood boost or something that's going to be um, something that the kids are going to think is kind of fun. Um, in our neighborhood, people were, um, every single week, there was something that kids were supposed to look for in the window. So it'd be like, look for a unicorn. And people would put like a stuffed animal unicorn in their window or something. And when we would go on walks, we'd be like, oh my gosh, look at the unicorn, look at that one. Um, or look at the rainbow. And that was something that was really fun um, for the kids um, to see the whole community kind of pulling together and trying to have fun ways to, to keep kids um, active and busy. We've done things like parades in the neighborhood where everyone stays in their car, but they come to somebody's um, house if it's someone's birthday or something like that. Um, so even organizing those types of things can be kind of fun um, for a family just to know that people are thinking of them. And again, my wish list, there are many more things, but we don't have enough time for everything that's on my wish list. <laughs> These are some really neat Great creative ideas. Thanks for that. Um, and this will be our last question um, because of our timing. Um, we have a question from another parent of a current student. How would you recommend helping a young adult with Asperger's who has the additional stress of looking for a job on top of the already holiday stresses? So I guess that one is sent my way. So yes, yes, I believe so. So. so you know, I had thought about chiming in when Amy addressed the issue of what to do with someone who's lost a job. And this is a very difficult time for everyone, whether you have Asperger's or you don't have Asperger's in terms of the job situation. And I think that really, in both cases, I would talk about going back to what Amy said, what is it that the, what is it that the young adult would think would be helpful? Because sometimes the current job situation isn't a good job situation. And sometimes we can take this opportunity. And in fact, I do have a nephew with Asperger's who honestly, we have, he has taken a step back and decided to get some additional education because it was a wonderful time to learn some new skills so he could retool 
to put himself in a different position about gaining a new job in the future. So I think how to address this really depends on whether someone's satisfied with the kind of work that they're doing at this moment in time, whether they think that this might be a good time to gain some new skills. There's lots of online learning opportunities at Case Western Reserve and everywhere else that students could enroll in classes that would give them some interesting new skills that might position them to gain better employment subsequent to the pandemic. What's unique about someone with Asperger's is that they like structure and predictability in a way that perhaps other people are better able to adjust to the lack of that structure and predictability. I think that desire for structure and predictability is something that we should capitalize on and help the, the young adult moving forward to use that desire for structure and predictability to help generate new skills so that they can beef up their resume to be able to get the job that they would like in the future to practice the skills. So wonderful. I think, wonderful. I think that answers it. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank our um, viewers for your um, really insightful questions today. Um, I want to thank Dr. Przeworski, Sharp Taylor and Short for the tremendous insights that they had into their topics. We really appreciate your time and expertise and, and, and your being with us here today. To our viewers, thank you for joining us today. Should you have any additional questions or comments on today's subject matter, please pass them along to the Alumni Association. An email address will be displayed on the screen momentarily um, after this concludes. And I wanna thank you all for joining us um, and please have a great and safe, happy and holiday season. And thank you so much. Take care, everybody.